I'm Al McFarlane. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarlane, broadcasting from the Marcus Garvey House here in North Minneapolis. And you know, it's all about the neighborhood. This is a conversation about how we build our community, our neighborhood, house by house, family by family. We're focusing on business creation, business development, economic development, and culture. It's a wonderful conversation, a robust conversation. One of the guides for this conversation is my brother, who takes us on a musical journey, Wayne McFarland and Jazz. Check him out. Try to make you blind, that's all right, cause through it all you still gon' shine. Stand up for your rights and you'll be left alone. Middle finger to the ones in the middle, wanna take your rights away. The mind is such a bright display. The voter card, I fight the day for Martin Malcolm Marcus. I did it, really got to admit it, it ain't hard to say. Put your hands up if you color broken, out of work, ain't got nowhere to go, but could and let you know, really here it ain't all good. When I look around, I'm looking in disgust. Thought for once things was looking up. And God we trust, now it's all on us. We the new freedom fight. On the bus, we ain't going now. We gon' ride no doubt till the wheels fall off. We the soldiers now. They move in, we gon' move them out like occupied homes over south. This our hood, we gon' hold it down. Can't eat good with a closed mouth. Can't complain if you don't go, even though I know it feel like your vote don't count. Welfare ain't playing fair. We don't need no one to pay our share. Healthcare equals health scare. The lesser of two evils, hell yeah. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. Listening to music that is intended to get you excited, to get you wound up, and get you thinking about your right to vote, your right to participate, to participate, excuse me. And so this is about how we engage. I thank you for tuning in. Uh, Conversations with Al McFarland, a program on KFAI and on public television, committed to bringing you robust conversations. And this, I say, is that. I want to start by introducing Nick Muhammad, the uh, executive director of the video you just saw a part of. Nick, you and the hip hop generation have declared you have a, a need to organize and mobilize our community to support uh, freedom and to support our voice to encourage people to vote no on the voter ID amendment. Talk about that. Thank you, Al. Um, and it's co-produced with uh, uh, Representative Bobby, Bobby Joe Champion. So uh, we both kind of directed it. But the, the interesting thing about it was when we heard about the amendment, we were working on this back in February. And the hip hop community, I began to speak out. So this video was one of the latest uh, uh, visibility campaigns that they wanted to launch to try to reach out and engage the youth to get involved. And the interesting thing about the video is there's a few artists that were, weren't even old enough to vote, um, but they were upset and they were compelled to actually you know, write and speak about it from their heart. So everybody that you're hearing that, that song is actually you know, writing uh, from, from their own position. So there's an EP, an entire EP that's gonna be released over the next three weeks called Face the Vote. Mm -hmm. uh, and they continue to expand upon the project. And we have two other videos that we'll, we'll be releasing as well, so. What's important to me, Nick Muhammad, is that you, by this action, are declaring right. that our community, our young people have an interest, have a stake in this election. Right. And you're getting out to make it happen. What are you doing to get it out? Well, the main thing is we're, we're utilizing the, the weapons that the youth uh, also master, you know, in, in a very eloquent way, which is social media. So like. We pushed this video out through Twitter, through Facebook, uh, through Instagram, through you know all the different social medias and norms and websites that are available to us. Um, from the largest label in the city, you know we've gotten participation from some you know national artists on the project as well. So th the main thing is just for visibility. So we push it out, YouTube it, Face the Vote, uh, Twitter it, uh, hashtag you know Vote No. There's a lot of different means that people can use to actually gain access to it. But it's a tool for us to spread around and use 
to kind of get the conversation going, especially intergenerationally amongst the, the, the participants. So, Nick Mama, thank you so very much. No problem, Al. I want to introduce uh, Josie Johnson, an elder and leader in our community. Josie, you've been at the front line of civil rights, of human rights, of the revolution in our community, uh, the fight for dignity, for inclusion for a long, long time, and your voice is cherished. Put in context with, will you, the need for our people to mobilize, organize, and to defend our freedom. Al, I thank you so much. Um, the reason I feel so passionately about this vote is that I worked with my father in 1945 on the elimination of the poll tax in Texas. I was born in Houston and raised in San Antonio, Texas. And we went door to door getting petitions to do away with a poll tax law that had been in Texas since 1903. It was 1965 after the uh, federal government and the amendment, 13th Amendment for the um, Voter Rights Act, the voter, the 13th Amendment was 1865. This is now 1965 that the Voting Rights Act was passed. Until 1967, that Texas actually acknowledged the 1965 voter rights. What has me so passionately concerned about us voting no on this amendment on the 6th of November? is that it's kind of strange to me that the voter restriction and all of its methods became such an important piece after the election of our president. And I recognize that whereas we as a people have been working very hard for voter uh, rights and going to the polls and voting, we really didn't show our full strength and possibility until 2008. And so here we are in 2012, after the 1965 Voter Rights Act, having to fight for it all over again. And that really, as an old woman and an old person involved in the issues of civil rights, to know that I'm once again having to face these same arguments and to try and gather our votes again, it is a troubling thing. I never thought that as a country we would go this far. You know, Al, it's kind of interesting because I have said, I never thought I'd live long enough to see a black man elected president, but I didn't think I would live long enough to see a group or a sector in our society that would rather pull the country down, mm -hmm. lose all sense of democracy to the point of what we're observing now. I never thought that the issues that were taught so carefully during slavery and immediately after and the years after, after, after were so deeply etched in the fabric of American life that they'd rather see the country go down than to do what is right and to work with our president. So it's a passion for me, mm -hmm. and I thank you for giving me a chance to tell that story. Thank you for all that you continue to do. You know, Benjamin Jealous is the president of the NAACP. Ben, thank you for coming back to Minnesota, Thanks to so Minneapolis. When you were here last week, you talked to the Fourth World Conference on uh, addressing the uh, creating remedies for inequality among people of color uh, in the economic arena. One of the things you said that struck me, uh, you encouraged our people to get back in the fight, to organize, organize, organize. What's at stake right now as you look at Minnesota with two amendments, one restricting the right to vote because of voter ID requirements, the other restricting, redefining what marriage is. Sure. What do you think? You know, look, there's, we've seen more states pass more laws, pushing more voters out of the ballot box since, since 
this past year than we've seen in any year since 1903 or thereabouts. There was a period after the Civil War uh, where for about 40 years, states year after year would pass new laws seeking to suppress the vote. And they only stopped, quite frankly, when the white supremacists who were pushing this, and you, and you go back and you look at it, and they were very clear. Felt like they had won. They had pushed all the people of color out of office, and they had won, so they stopped. Well, I predict that if they don't succeed, they, them being this, these same kind of anti-democratic forces that we've really seen throughout, our, throughout the, the history of our country. I mean, it, it goes back much further than the Civil War. After the very revolution that created this country, they, them, this group of anti-democratic forces who are always on the side of the rich, said to the populists, who were by far the biggest number of people in the revolution, Sorry, but you all can't vote either. Like, we're not letting the Negroes vote, we're not letting our wives vote, and we're not letting you vote either because you don't own any land, and we believe that your vote can be bought. And well, our wife, well, she would just do what we told her to, so that's not fair to unmarried men. And, and well, you know, the, the uh, black folks, we weren't even thinking about giving them the right to vote, right? So you see this anti-democratic tradition that parallels these big democratic advances. And so it shouldn't su surprise us just to kind of re I guess, reacting to what Dr. Johnson was talking about, it really shouldn't surprise us that after a major democratic advance, like the breaking of the color barrier at the White House, uh, and, the, and the installing of a black man, his black wife, his two black kids, and his black dog in the White House, that we would see this sort of reaction. Because literally every time um, we've seen a major advance right back to the founding itself, we've seen this anti-democratic backlash. We should also be prepared for it to last for decades. I think I would predict that we would probably see 40 years of attempts. What's gonna happen in 40 years this time is 40 years from this year, this country becomes majority people of color, about 2052. And at that point, either the forces of voter suppression are gonna to have to figure out a new game and try to get along with folks, or they will have succeeded. That's, you know, that's what the stakes are. So this time on the ballot, it's pretty clear. People need to vote no when it comes to voter ID. And this other issue of marriage equality, and the so-called marriage uh, uh, amendment, it's a bit more of a sleeper. You know, our folks in North Carolina faced a very similar amendment a few months ago that actually uh, um, prompted President Obama and then the NAACP to speak out nationally. He came to view this as a Trojan horse issue. Ostensibly, this is about the issue of marriage. Really, what it's really about is about civil marriage, uh, whether or not a judge can discriminate, because the first Amendment's pretty clear that churches and temples can continue to, to determine who they want to marry, not want to marry, based pretty much on any criteria. Um, but what they say is the Trojan horse is that when states do this, when they encode discrimination into their constitution, what changes, right? What will change here the next day is that a century of using state constitutions, federal constitutions to expand rights exclusively, right? those are the only real changes that we've made over the last century of things that expand rights, will have been ended. And we will be, have begun to reverse course. And our folks in North Carolina, many of whom uh, were sort of pro-traditional marriage as far as their church, said, A, civil marriage is a civil right, and I'm not gonna empower a judge to discriminate against anybody based on what they are, but B, Really, truly, apart from that issue, I'm not going to be part of using a state constitution to restrict rights for anybody. Because once you go down that road, our community can only be further hurt. Next time it might be the vote. You know, um, it, 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 it might be affirmative action. It might be something else. As soon as you open up that Pandora's box of using constitutions to restrict rights, people of color will be hurt again and again. Let me turn to Commissioner Kevin Lindsay. He's the Human Rights Commissioner of the State of Minnesota. Kevin, uh, from your lawyer background, put this in context. What are the two issues on the ballot? Uh, and what are, is your office doing as a champion of human rights to educate and address the issue for Minnesota citizens? Sure, thanks, Al. The Minnesota Human Rights Act, in its preamble, it talks about the very foundations of democracy being stabilized, maintained by ensuring that discrimination is eradicated. If we allow discrimination to ha grab hold within our state, within our country, it unbinds the very fabric of democracy. That's what the executive director was talking about, and that's what Dr. Johnson is talking about. So for our office, uh, 
we're educating people about both of the constitutional amendments and talking about how both are embedding discrimination in the Constitution and taking away fundamental liberties and rights through the ballot box. And in both instances, when you take a look to see what is going on, uh, the answer for our office is quite clear, is that Minnesotans should be voting no. So when we take a look at the voting rights uh, issue, it's going to create barriers for individuals who are elderly within our uh, state because there's a large number of them which do not have a government-issued photo ID, and there are difficulties and challenges in getting it. So, for example, there's more than 330,000 Minnesotans that are over the age of 75, but there's only 275,000 Minnesota, 275, Minnesotans that have a driver's license. There's a gap there. What are we going to do with those individuals? Individuals within nursing homes, assisted living, that are living at home, that have given up the right to drive, they're going to be impacted. Individuals with disabilities, about 10% in the state of Minnesota, don't have a photo ID. They're going to be impacted. Individuals who are in the military are also going to be impacted because the legislation or the constitutional amendment says substantial equivalent photo identification to vote. Substantial equivalent photo identification to vote. So I want you to imagine you're standing in front of an election poll official with your driver's license in your hand, handing it to the election official. That military personnel, in order to be able to vote, is going to have to demonstrate something substantially equivalent to you with that driver's license in front of the election official. And how are they going to do that when they're in Afghanistan? How are they going to do that when they're in Iraq? How are they going to do that when they're halfway around the world? There's nothing talking about paying for election officials to travel to all those spots. And by the way, this is an unfunded mandate. There are a lot of counties within this, this state that are going to be severely impacted. A lot of people don't know it, but in the state of Minnesota, there are nine counties that use mail-in procedure as a primary means by which they get votes. There are some counties which have done away with polling places because they have so few citizens and they rely almost exclusively on mail-in procedures. So what is that then going to mean for those counties? Well, again, the constitutional amendment says substantial equivalent. That means they're going to have to now recreate an in-person election system when, for financial reasons, they went away from that. And in order for the Constitution to be upheld, those states are going to have to bear that cost because the legislature has not provided for it. Yeah, and they say it could be 5 to $10 million, right, that we're, we're talking about here. Well, Governor, Governor Arne Carlson, in about a week ago, uh, to your question, had estimated that the cost may go up to $100 million. Because when you talk about all the respective counties, and I, I'll give you one, Kittison County, which is a very small county that has 2,800 individuals uh, who can, are eligible to vote. The county itself only has 4,552 residents. The top election official there estimated that it would cost $730,000 to be able to build town halls, to build computer equipment, to update the one town hall they have within the county to make sure that it's ADA compliant to get to meeting the standard of substantial equivalent of someone having a photo ID in an election polling place. Those are the costs. Those are the things that all citizens in Minnesota need to know when they're voting on this. If, do you want me to address it or do you want me to come back? We'll come back I know I'm it. rolling, we'll come sorry. Back to it. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> I'm Al McFarland. You're listening to Conversations with Al McFarland. We'll come back and continue this conversation in just a minute. Stay tuned. Ambassador of the brown voice. Me hint that we got a choice. Too lit to be her. Recognize where we stand in this plan. I demand this is nothing to avoid in a land where scholarship checks void. And we bury our girls and boys. Do the bullet wounds while they watch the cartoons and news who are more to be deployed. He's a card of so of God. You can die for 13 tripes. Police, these are casualties before they even read us our rights. Women of color curse twice. We have now we give more life. Planned parenthood in a dream back to marry a husband or a wife. I took a peek at the speeches and must have seen a demon. Must have the gusto to crush the seed that could feed the heathens. It ain't a deeper reason than seeing your people grieving. Believe in skip what he say, leave that beefing thing at BK. Seen three teams that live like D-Day, war in the streets, no peace, don't be safe. And I don't know the ins and the outs, I don't really know what this is about. And I don't know who runs this world, I just know we don't. We ain't got no power, if we don't speak out, then we won't exist. Next thing on the list is cross us out. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome back to Conversations with Al McFarland. Uh, the issue is critical. Uh, two issues on the Minnesota ballot in November. One, uh, a constitutional amendment to 
restrict voting by requiring new voter ID rules. The other, uh, redefining what it means to be a married couple. Uh, you were continuing on the impact of the voter ID issue in particular. Go ahead and finish the thought, uh, Commissioner. I'll leave some for the legislators to address, but I do want to jump to the other issue which you raised sure. in the beginning, and that is the marriage amendment. And I do think, to pick up to on the executive director's point, let us all be clear. If this amendment is voted down, no religious organization will have to change who they decide to marry. Okay? So if you are Catholic and you're against two individuals of the same gender, you are not going to be required to marry two individuals of the same gender. If you are Jewish and you do not wish to marry two individuals of the same gender, you are not going to be obligated. That is going to remain the same. What we're talking about is the state. And the question then becomes, when is it appropriate for the state to tell a grown person, an adult, that they cannot do something? And that's what we're talking about. So if we talk to adults and they have the right to educate themselves wherever they want to, they have the right to live wherever they want to, they have the right to work wherever they want to, but when it comes to sharing their most intimate dreams, secrets, and desires, we're gonna tell them that they can't marry someone else? Well, why? And what is that legitimate purpose for doing that? That doesn't mean that any religion is gonna to have to accept that individual couple, but why are we as a state going to deny those two individuals from having that well, type of relationship. When, when did the state become the official matchmaker? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and you call it a wedge issue early. Right? I know, look, so, I mean, that, that's, that's all this is. I mean, it's real cynical. You know, you, you, uh, when, you, when I say that's all it is, obviously, we think people of good conscience can disagree on this personally. But when you look at who's really putting money behind this and groups like the National Organization for Marriage, they have interests there, investing a lot of money in this issue, who will really have much larger interests, uh, who oftentimes aren't weighing in on social issues, but on issues related to the economy, the environment. And their vested interest is pretty clear, which is driving a wedge inside of the black community. Our power ultimately comes from the fact that for centuries, Black people in this country who have voted, whether it's a small group of freemen or whether it's the larger population that we have now, have been more likely to vote like other black people than white people are to vote like other white people, than Latinos are to vote like other Latinos. So it's a combination of us organizing, but ultimately settling our differences behind closed doors and presenting a united front that's been the secret to our power. In 2004, uh, far right-wing zealots got a window into a possibility when they saw George W. Bush get the highest percentage of the black vote since Richard Nixon back in 68. He got 11% by pushing the Defense of Marriage Act. And they said, huh, well, this is a, this is a possibility. This is an opportunity. This is a way to drive a wedge between the, the, the black community and itself. And so that's why, you know, that's their pitch. When you look at, you know, if you go online, you Google National Organization from for, for marriage, you will quickly come across their internal strategy papers that have been made public against their, their best wishes. And what's pretty clear is that they see this as a, a wedge issue. This is the tip of the spear, and we need to understand what it is and repel it uh, appropriately. Senator Jeff Hayden represents uh, District 62 in South Minneapolis. And Senator Hayden, what's the environment in our legislature? I wanted you and Representative Rena Moran to talk about the political environment both in the community, but at the legislature itself, where these bills have come? Well, you know, um, <clears throat> well, first of all, thanks, Al, and, and the panel for being here. It has been a very caustic environment, especially this last uh, biennium in the legislature when the, um, when the GOP uh, took over. Um, we were faced with a large deficit. Um, we were faced with issues um, uh, with our schools in terms of borrowing and trying to figure out how to get our fiscal house in order, and that's what... Uh, the leaders of the legislature ran on. But what we spent the most time on is these issues. Uh, we spent hours upon hours upon hours on wedge issues, on issues around uh, marriage, 
uh, on this issue of photo ID. Uh, a lot of time in committee talking about if we were going to do what they did in Wisconsin and take away collective bargaining from the labor unions. That's where we spent our time is on the issues that divide people, not on how do we come together and make this a better state, or not even on how do we fix our fiscal house and you know uh, moving forward. Um, you know, I'll mention that um, one of the the deputy uh, 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 the communications director in the Senate. Um, and also was serving as the Republican Party's deputy chair, uh, recently just came out, just the other day, and, and, and as a chief architect of this movement, said that it was only to bring conservative voters out, and it was only to drive a wedge in communities of color. He said it, right? He's talking about this openly. Now, he's having some problems with his own party, and then if you follow Minnesota politics, we, we, we know who that is and, and, and kind of where he's going. But they admitted directly that that was the only reason why they spent time on this issue, was to try to divide our community uh, and hopefully to drive out conservative voters uh, because they know that the reason why they were in control was not so much that they brought out more people or their issues were right, it's just that many of us didn't come back to the voting polls. So that's why we're really pushing this issue, telling people to vote no and making sure that they actually get out to vote. So Representative Rena Moran, what's happening on the street, on the ground level in your district? What are you hearing from voters, uh, people that you're door knocking, uh, seeking to have them send you back to the legislature? What are they saying about this issue and other issues? So um, thank you for the invitation to be here. But even before I, I get to that point, I just like to state that, you know, I was in Memphis a couple of months ago and had opportunity to visit the Civil Rights Museum. And there you see a path, you know, we see the struggles, we see the fight, we see the barriers that was in place for, for African Americans to just to be recognized as to have a voice in society in all, within all the systems. But it was at that moment when I came within to the, within the museum, the, uh, the 1965 Right to Vote Act, and saw the struggles of my people, you know, my ancestors, that, it became so real to me, although it has always been real, about it was that reminder of the fight, the loss of dignity that we had to go through to get to 1965, to get to 20, 2012, and to say, this is where we are. We are back at this moment. Here we are in 2012, and we are back at 1965, where we're fighting that fight. And so for me, it is making that connection with the people in our community to educate them, to engage them around what this legislation means. Not only that, is that the way it is presented on the ballot is not even worded the way it is in legislation. But also the bigger part of that, because through just hearing you know, voter ID, one would say, well, why not have an ID? Why should we not show an ID? We show it for when we go for, you know, to the grocery store or to buy cigarettes or whatever. But it is clear. It is so clear as it was back in with the 13th Amendment in the 1800s when we were, when we had um, the Southern whites uh, bringing up these laws that around a poll tax or being able to read or own, owning property. This is the only way you can vote. And we can see clearly who was left out of that process. Because you, as we know, along with that became the 15th Amendment, which gave the black man the right to vote, right? And immediately, we got these Jim Crow laws that began to perk up. And so here we are in the 21st century where we are um, encountered with a 21st century voter ID law that is about weeding people out of the electoral process, but also bringing division within our community. Now, I believe any time that we are creating a law that says that within our Constitution, we're going to take away rights, which our Constitution is not about, has never been about taking away rights. It is about that freedom you know, the right for us as Americans to all to have our place in society. Here we are at a place where we're going to say that we're going to decide and weed out through a process who would not have their vote heard. And I think it goes to the dignity part because when I've been going around the state and I 
indicate that the Secretary of State has said more than 200,000 Minnesotans do not have a photo identification. The response back is, well, why not just go get it? Yeah. Why not just go have it, you know? Well, well then it becomes to the question of the cost associated with getting the underlying documents to no, get to right. it. And, and know, that you, goes you, to that property well, question. And you have a lot of people, especially older people, who didn't actually ever have a birth certificate when they were born. I mean, there's a lot of assumptions that people who, who are relatively privileged make about what life is like for other people that just don't hold up when you dig into it. But I think even more important than that is that we have a system that is in place. There's a model for the rest of the world. We have one of the most inclusive um, election day process. Right. right. But if, you what if, you, if I can add on to that, the, it says that you must present a photo ID in order to vote. Um, but it, but it, but no one has ever been convicted of voter impersonation, well, right? It, it, that's so, the really crazy part. Right, right. So, really so, so the issue of um, we have laws that says who can and who can't vote. So a person who is ineligible to vote today, say a felon that hasn't finished uh, paying his debt to society, can still present their photo ID and go vote, right? And we figure out if that person was eligible on the back end. So there's nothing that a, a photo ID does at the point that they go vote that really, that, that, that really stops well, people from voting. There's one other point that I think is really critical, and it goes to what the representative said. Our struggle to vote is a right, not a privilege. Right. Other people have the privilege of presenting their ID to buy a bottle of beer or whatever. That isn't what we fought for. Yeah. Ours is a right, not a privilege. So we can't allow people to redirect the discussion about what's the big deal. Everybody has to present an ID. That's quite true. But that isn't what we fought for. No, 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 no. That's spot on. And the other part, to go to what the senator said, is that a law that's not intended to solve a problem right. is intended to create a problem. Right, exactly. And that's what we're dealing with. So, Ben, let me close this section with coming back to you again on the comments you made last week when you were here. And you said that one of the challenges, maybe one of the failures in our community now, is our uh, dropping the ball in teaching our young people to fight. Mm. What do you mean by that? Well, I certainly wasn't talking about your family because I've met your daughter and she's a fighter. <laughs> but the, the um, uh, look, my family has belonged to the NAACP now for six generations. My children are the sixth generation. My, I was the, the fifth. Um, for the first four, it was the expectation that you would fight. When it got to my generation, the line was basically, son, you, you just need to kind of keep your nose clean, study hard. All you all got to do is just reap what we've sown. Because we've killed all the big dragons. We defeated segregation just like we, our grandparents defeated the slavery. And then my generation came of age just in time to find ourselves the most murdered in the country and the most incarcerated on, on the planet. Mm -hmm. So apparently the whole not fighting thing didn't work too well. <laughs> and so our theory at the NAACP is a very simple theory. And it's basically it's the theory of our democracy. If we train our children to be so invested in our democracy that they will fight to be included. They will fight to hold on to their right to vote. They will fight to make sure that their voices are heard and that their, their needs are met in this society as much as any group's needs can be net, uh, met and that uh, unfair laws are eviscerated and we move ever closer to and freedom and justice for all, then things will get better and better. But if we don't, if we um, sort of make that experiment with my generation the rule, then we can expect things to get worse and worse. The other thing I thought you said very importantly the other week was you said we must treat our history not with nostalgia, but with instruction. And I think that's where we really must be today. It's no well, and that's why it's so important for you to be sitting here talking about what we did to get rid of the poll tax. Because the reality is that one of the most important lessons we learned from the poll tax is that as long as there's a poll tax, you have to pay it so that you have the power to vote the people out of office who put it in place in the first place. And so that's why you know, our message in, the, in these states where voter ID has been put in place, like in Tennessee right now, mm -hmm. to people is go out and get your ID and then go vote and then, and then change the, the uh, situation. It breaks my heart, Dr. Johnson, to listen to you, to listen to my grandmother or to anybody else who has lived long enough to see the poll tax 
done away with and then put back in place right. the way it has in there. And Minnesota, the other just interesting piece for all of us, Minnesota would be the only other state besides Mississippi that has put this in their constitution. Well, you know, and I gotta say, based on the, on the disparity st statistics that you see here, in which M Minnesota on several points falls just behind Mississippi, that um, M Minnesota really has a choice here, right? It can either decide to become more and more like Mississippi with snow, or it can de de decide to you know, respect uh, the tradition of so many great Minnesotans, whether it's Hubert Humphrey or Roy Wilkins, and actually be that great beacon in this region for civil and human rights. And that's the choice that's in front of the voters. And that's why we're saying, you know, vote no, vote no twice and make Minnesota nice. <laughs> I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. We'll continue and conclude in just a moment. Stay tuned. Time is now more than ever. Then got a represent, set a precedent for the president. If we don't interject, then our residents will be negligent. I recommend vote no for the voter ID this year at the polls, brother. Get your ass off the floor, brother. They targeting your color. Hey, believe it or not, the truth is, homie, then look at your block. Read between the lines and view the plot. We can do something, but we got to stop. Procrastinating, if we don't, we self-assassinating. Pointless of emancipation. True freedom will be advocating. Vote no. Suppression, it keeps us from being lifted. They treat our rights wrong as if they are privileges. Abusing their authority, the target's the minority. Try ignoring me, guarantee that you'll hear more from me. I'm speaking for the people, we fight for the 15th Amendment. I figured out your tactics to keep us in prison. Attack on the masses with distractions, but the fake attention. So much provision is sickening, lack of knowledge hurts us. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome back to Conversations with Al McFarland. I want to go to Justin Terrell. He's with Justice for All. He's a program manager. And you guys are working hard to get the knowledge, get the people organized. What are you doing? Yeah, absolutely. So Justice for All is a program of Take Action Minnesota. Take Action Minnesota is a statewide organization. And uh, we're focused on fighting for uh, racial and economic and social justice. <laughs> Um, we develop leaders in the community, and uh, we help them to advocate for issues that are important to them. And uh, this is why we're so, uh, why, why defeating the voter restriction amendment is our number one priority right now. Um, it pretty much threatens everything that we believe in and everything that we are trying to organize and fight for. And so um, the Justice for All program, uh, my program is based, basically we're working to reduce um, some of those embarrassing um, disparities that impact us in the black community here in Minnesota, like 27% unemployment. And so every weekend from now until uh, the election, uh, we're organizing in North Minneapolis, we're door knocking, talking to people about uh, why this uh, amendment, the photo ID amendment is, is, um, is, is a problem and it's something that we need to fight against. And um, a few weeks ago, he brought 100 volunteers from across the country to organize against this thing. And we're committed to being in the community and making sure that this thing goes down. Well, you know, I'm so impressed with you and with your generation. I think that you and Nick and other young people in the community really reflect what the truth is about our potential and our propensity to engage and to fight. And so let it be said that we have a generation of fighters young men and women organized and committed to tell our truth in a way that gains and progresses our community. Nick, you all are doing tremendous work with music and with the hip hop generation. And I think it's important to say you've taken a stand. What's going on the next few days around voter ID and around the uh, marriage amendment? Well, uh, first of all, there's going to be a huge uh, concert dedicated to um, getting out the vote. And there we will have Face the Vote actually performing the, the 28th uh, at First Avenue. Um, that to be said, uh, the largest hip hop label in the state of Minnesota has dedicated almost their entire roster to coming out and actually engaging and speaking out on this issue. And just to put that in perspective, uh, Soundset, which is the largest hip hop festival in the country, draws annually over 40,000 Minnesotans to Canterbury Downs. So they're, they're really putting their, their all within this, you know, thanks to Congressman Keith 
uh, pulling the strings to get this thing going, and he recognizes the power that hip hop actually has with our youth. So all we're doing is trying to get hip hop back to its original roots, which was an intelligent movement. That's what the music is actually supposed to be about. And it's not too far uh, or long ago that you can look through hip hop and actually see things that used to compel people to get to action. Um, it just took us a while to get through all the corporate interests to get back to our youth and give them a platform where they can speak. And, and, the, and the biggest misconception is that they have to be engaged and brought up to speed. They're already engaged. Mm -hmm. they, just, they just need to be included and respected and they're, empowered. They're, they're, they're ignored. They're, they're engaged, ignored. But ignored. There we go. And, and, that, and, and our they, job is to communicate uh, the awareness. And build to the let bridge. Because yeah, it it's a part of our power. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's an incredible power to wield. And if we don't you know, exercise all the outlets that we have in order to make this thing you know, as loud or, or call to action as loud as we possibly can, we only you know, uh, uh, shorten, shorten ourselves in the deal. Congressman, thank you for dropping in, and thank you for what you do. Uh, how do you weigh in on these two issues for uh, Minnesota? What do you want voters to know? Well, I want voters to vote no on both of these unconstitutional amendments. Uh, the first one, uh, vo uh, voter restriction, is simply trying to uh, take us backward. They're literally trying to put limiting the vote, reducing the size of the electorate in the Constitution. And so for you young folks to be participating and fighting so hard at knock and at take action, it's just really inspiring. You know, I, I tell you, you guys might watch the movie Eyes on the Prize, and you might think, wow, how great it would be to be back in those days standing with those heroes. Well, that's you today. Mm -hmm. You are living that legacy. Then the other one, uh, the, the anti-marriage amendment, all I say is this. Let adults make decisions for themselves. The government shouldn't be deciding who marries who. They used to want to say that uh, if you were a certain color, you couldn't marry somebody of another color. And now they want to say, if you're the same gender as somebody else, that you can't marry them. Look, it's not our business. It's somebody else's business. You don't have to approve of it. You don't have to be for it. Just let people make their own decisions for their own lives. I think democracy needs to prevail. That means freedom of choice, in my mind. Ben, you want to weigh in on that? You know, first of all, what the hip hop community is doing here is what it should be doing across the country. Right? Um, hip hop comes out of a tradition of resistance, and we need to teach our young people um, that they really have, really affirm, affirm that our young people have a lot of power to tr transform this society. What's happening right now, these two amendments are directly targeted at their generation. Mm -hmm. Their generation, the rising generation of voters in this society, um, is the most inclusive that we've ever seen. Not just the most diverse, mm -hmm. not just the most pro-civil and human rights, but the, the most inclusive that we've ever seen. They truly are the least likely to care what you are, mm -hmm. and the most likely to care what you are about. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, this voter ID is targeted at young people of all colors. Yes, it'll disproportionately hurt people of color of all ages, but it will also go after young people of all colors. Uh, that will make their generation less potent at the ballot box. And why is this generation such a concern at this moment? Because it was this generation that broke the color barrier at the White House. Why? Because they are the most inclusive that we've ever seen. Uh, the second thing is that this is about who they will marry, right? Because most older people have already made that decision. Right? This is about who they will marry. And you know, again, as somebody whose parents found their marriage in 1966 illegal, because my dad was white and my mom was black, and who's grown up with these conversations about marriage equality his entire life, I've met a lot of people who supported anti-miscegenation laws way back then, who were against marriage equality way back then when the issue was about color. I haven't met any of them who are proud of it today. And I really haven't met anybody whose child or grandchild is proud of them today. So people, when they go to, into that ballot box, should understand that history will judge them. And if they go into that ballot box seeking to encode discrimination, their own children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great are likely to judge them harshly. And so that in this country, which is the most inclusive country the world has ever known, is our birthright, is our responsibility to make our country ever more inclusive not reverse that trend. Kevin Lindsay, weigh in here if you would. Again, sort of clarify the choices then that we are facing here in Minnesota. Uh, you're the um, commissioner of the Human Rights Department. Your job is to defend and uphold. Clarify this for us one more time. 
Sure, and I'll pick up on that last point. When the Constitution was crafted, they didn't say it was a perfect union. They said they're trying to create a more perfect union. And we have been struggling since the very beginning to include more in. So as the executive director said at the very beginning, it was not just white males, but white males with property. And you know what? Every time that we've included more people in, the country has gotten better and stronger. Yep. And that's what this is really about, to have a true democracy, a real democracy. It's inclusion for all. And that's where we're really heading with both of these. If we do not vote no, if we do not say that this is wrong, we're saying that we don't care as much for our democracy. And that's really what it comes down to. You can't know that 200,000 people don't have a photo ID and then juxtapose that and say that it's okay to exclude those individuals from voting without damaging your democracy. You can't say to a grown adult person that it's okay to choose where you live, where you're educated, where you're housing, but when you want to decide who you want to love, you can't do that. I really appreciate what you said, Congressman Ellison, because I think there are a lot of people who kind of go back nostalgically and they said, well, I don't have a chance to sort of make a difference in my country or in my state. I'd submit to both Justin and to Nick that you and what you are doing and other young folks out there now, they're really shaping what Minnesota is going to become, what this country is going to become. And I'm ever hopeful that we're going to make the right choice and that our country is going to be much stronger when Minnesota shows the way by voting no on both amendments. Let me step back for a second and ask you, uh, Ben Jealous, to, to look at this from the national. And these are the topics of the day in Minnesota. But you've got other things on your plate as well. And let's take a minute to have you talk about the variety of priorities that the NAACP is addressing across the country that ought to have residents here as well. Look. When you look at the stats in this state, it's clear uh, that this state really needs to come together as a state and recognize that all the children in this state are all, I say this, belong to the entire state. Right? They are all Minnesota's children. So the fact that black children have a huge graduation disparity right here isn't a black problem, it's a Minnesota problem. Our focus across the country, look, on health, we're focused on stopping the spread of the AIDS virus in this country. Um, first and foremost, on, on health disparities more generally and making sure that this country doesn't go backward with regards to access to health care the way that, that Paul Ryan would like to see, it, no matter what seat he's in, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, with regards to schools, we are very much focused on making sure that every state, every county do, does those things that define the best counties and the best states in this country, and that's to make sure that... Uh, Every child has access to a, a high quality teacher. Um, that kids show up to kindergarten ready to learn means that you have universal pre-K um, and so forth. Those, that's, those are the types of issues that we should be talking about. And as a country, we really need to be talking about this crisis of mass incarceration. Our country doesn't just have the most incarcerated black people on the planet or brown people. We have the most incarcerated white people on the planet. A white man in America today is as likely to be incarcerated as a black man in South Africa at the height of apartheid when South Africa was the world's leading incarcerator. That's a white man in America. A black man's five times more likely to be incarcerated than, than either group. We have 5% of the world, people got 25% of the world's prisoners. It is bankrupting state by state. If you wonder, for instance, in California, where, where, where I'm from, and I know the stats a little better than I do here in Minnesota, but it's the same trend across the country. If you wonder why, for instance, um, it used to be, I think, about $5 a credit to go to the community college. Now it's $46 a credit. Why tuition has gone up across the California uh, public higher education system and so many others across the country. Uh, it is because the incarceration rate in my lifetime has skyrocketed. When I was a kid, we spent 3% of the state budget on prisons and 11% on public universities. Now it's 11% on prisons and 7.5% on public universities. And that difference is being paid for by increased tuition. As the president of Penn State said before the Paterno issue, his biggest problem every year was exactly the same, fighting to keep so much money from going to the state Penn so more could come to Penn State. 
those are the issues that we should be talking about, but, but these issues really have become weapons of mass distraction from a right wing that doesn't want us to engage on the real issues, but rather force us to fight them on these arcane issues from a different century that they're imposing on us now. Okay, all right, Keith. I, I just wanna say, I remember when you were uh, selected as the NAACP uh, leader, and it was a little controversial, I was for you, but <laughs> I just I want you, well, I, well, that's true. Yeah. But I just want to say, I know that after they've seen you do your thing for a few years, they know that you are the right guy, man. You are right on time, man. You are there. I love everything you said. And, and Ben was also the leader of our Black Press of America. He yeah, was really, it was, it was Al over there who <laughs> trained me. <laughs> Secret well kept. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> I want to close with uh, Scott Gray. Scott, thank you for allowing us to hold this sure. program here sure. at the Minneapolis Urban League. And if you would take a minute sort of putting this in the context of what happens with the Urban League, organizations like the Urban League, sure. how do we mobilize sure. and project and pursue interest for the advancement of our people? Sure. Well, well in the words of um, President Jealous, we can't, we can't make this a snowy Mississippi. Um, I just think that we can't afford to go backwards. Uh, 50 to 100 million dollars to change a system that's already working um, is a problem. And when we talk about the disparities that we see in this town, um, there's a lot of work to do. And to be trying to decide over what system works, um, you know, to, 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 to block or disenfranchise folks to get out to vote, um, what about jobs? What about education? What about all of the things that make this state or will make this state strong. I mean, we're talking about less than 5% unemployment or 5.5% unemployment here. I mean, there is the need, there is the will here to do some great things, but will we do it? We keep looking at these, you know, the, the, whatever it takes to disenfranchise us as African Americans, what if, what if we use the power that we had in, in 1965? What if we use the power that we, 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 we recaptured in 2008 uh, to put in a black president. What if we could put that attention towards jobs, education, health, um, and just building wealth in our community? I think we can do a lot more here, Al. And thanks for, for this panel, for being here. Thanks, Congressman, for dropping in. Glad to have you here. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and we just got a lot more work to do, and hopefully we can get past November 6th. Uh, we will get past That's November right. 6th, no we're doubt gonna, about it. We're going to win. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. Absolutely. Thank you. I want to thank all of you. Thank uh, this panel, thank uh, you who are in the audience and those who are listening on KFAI, those watching on public television across Twin Cities. Uh, thank you for being involved in this conversation. The work uh, is in front of us, and we're equal to the work. We can do this. It's a question of getting busy, not stopping, fighting fighting, that means organizing, organizing. Let's get busy, let's organize, let us win. Thank you so much. See you next time. I can't even vote, but I ain't gonna sit back here and choke. Vote I deep my team like no. I swear they try and sink I vote. I'm tired of all of this nonsense. Ignorance, I'm not feeling this. So everybody that's listening, vote by me with no ID. Hey. My ballot is my bullet now. Come November, pull it out and dump, dump. At they suppression, we gotta vote it down. Stop playing, vote it down. Stop playing, vote it down. Wake up, wake up, walk out, look up, read the damn news. Man, this stuff applies to you. Maybe go talk amongst your crew. These people say what you should do. Never trust the next dude. Show and prove. Tell me why I shouldn't let you just do you. I'm talking big bank takes little bank. That bait and switch them chains. Some people win, some people lose. They way to play the game. They say it's just for your protection. I know where I'm placing blame. They here to lose. I think they here to keep me out they lane. Some came over on the boat, some came in on the raft, some came in on the aircraft carrier. Some put that boot to your throat to revoke what happened to the more the merrier. They standing on the island of Ellis, and when I start standing up for mine, they jealous. When the times get hellish, no, I got up on my mind, be alive with my fellas and my ladies too. They trying to get us all back to 1882, so they made an amendment, meant it, meant this ain't gonna make it through. Cause I'm standing with my folks, standing on my boat, knowing that I'm back to the ropes. And best bet 10-6, I'ma get back in the booth and I'm checking off, no, you know. Yeah. 
speak for my generation they think we ain't debating they fake acts based on accusations discrimination how many politicians put themselves in opposition you voices what they missing claim we don't pay attention that's the collision on truth and true opinion they don't see our vision they excuses good intentions well the vision is clear despite what you might hear we hear voices with actions about to hop in the gear yeah Tell me who's included, tell me who's excluded. People of color, low income, it's time we start the movement. We won the right to vote, now it's under attack. Voter suppressing, got me stressing, trying to set us back. Threaten democracy, no stopping till no power's left. A fake solution with no problem, trying to solve itself. My people died to vote, respect the legacy. No vote, I ID, hit the streets, we must defeat. All our guests in the house, two million people out there, I know you're listening on the internet, KSA High, come on, come on, listen to the show. It's clear. Everybody knows we gotta give it life. 